can't just leave. Protecting the church is more important than family. Okay, so here's my story. My name is Nora Crest. I was born a Scientologist. Both of my parents had worked in Scientology in the 1970s. And shortly after I was born, they both left working for Scientology. Um, we lived a quasi normal life. I went to one Scientology school until I was about in the second grade. But other than that, I went to public school my whole life. But um, at the age of eight, my parents divorced and um, my mother wanted me to be a normal human and go to college and follow my dreams, which were many. And um, my father had decided that there was nothing more important than the entire world than Scientology. And so when I would visit him, Every activity that we did would be centered around volunteering at a church, uh, putting me on the Scientological e-meter to discover if I had past life recall, um, and uh, in general, just trying to get me to be more interested in Scientology than anything else that I had going on in my life. Um, I didn't tell my mom about that at the time. Uh, I regret that now. And at the age of 18, when I finished high school, I moved to Los Angeles and started working at the Lewis Carroll Academy of the Arts as the PE and reading teacher, because according to Scientology, if you can read, then you are qualified to teach other people to read, even though you haven't gone to college. And about a few months into that, um, my father put a tremendous amount of pressure on me to start dating a Scientologist and to uh, get onto Scientology courses myself. So he put me on the uh, Affinity Exchange, which was a website run by a Scientologist to get my profile out there. This is before Match.com and all that other stuff. And um, uh, told me that I needed to start doing courses, which I did at Celebrity Center International. Within about three weeks of being on course, I was heavily recruited for the C organization. Now I had been being recruited for the C organization since I was about eight years old. And in Scientology, that's not unusual. When you were born into a Scientology family, they consider it a fact that you chose your body. And that's proof that you were a Scientologist in your last lifetime because you have now come back to continue your Scientology training. And this sort of insane thoughts was validated for Scientologists when I was 14, um, I achieved the state of clear, which is the goal of the book Dianetics. And um, at that time, because I was so young and I hadn't this lifetime received any Dianetic auditing, it was determined that I had in fact reached that state of clear in my previous life. So it was pretty much for sure that I had on purpose picked my parents had chosen to come here and I was pretty much dragging my feet in coming back from my leave of absence that I got when I died. So at the age of 18 on January 29th, 1995, I joined the Sea Organization at Celebrity Center International. I very quickly uh, got through the basic training and was immediately put onto the post of recruiter, which was terrible. Um, I really was terrible at it. I didn't hardly, I don't think I recruited anybody. Um, and then um, I tried to leave. They said no. Nope. Um, and they say no in a way where they make it clear to you that if you do try and leave, um, they will make sure that your family disconnects from you uh, because they will make sure that you leave in such a way that you are no longer in good standing with Scientology. So of course I didn't want to lose my family, so I stayed. And in October of 1995, my father passed away of a massive heart attack. Um, he was 45 years old, I was 19. It was just before my baby sister's 16th birthday. Um, I again tried to leave. Their solution was to send me to Florida 
for six months of training to become a word clearer, which is a fancy term in Scientology for someone who helps someone else understand the words that they're reading by helping them to use a dictionary. Um, I was very good at my job. In fact, I was the best word clearer on the planet. Uh, I worked with a lot of celebrities. I worked with non-celebrities, uh, just regular people, people's parents, um, some famous people's children, all of whom were very nice. Um, I never had any problems in that area. I was doing really well. I met Tom Cruise one time. I didn't actually work with him, but I worked with his kids very briefly. I did work with John Travolta one time. He was a very lovely man, um, very quiet and apologetic for taking my time, even though it was my job to work with him. Um, I worked with Catherine Bell. I worked with um, Lisa Marie Presley's child, uh, daughter. I worked with Lisa Marie Presley's daughter, Riley. Um, and all of this was just uh, helping them to understand the scriptures. I shouldn't say scriptures. Um, all of this was helping them to understand the books and lectures that they were reading or listening to. And I got engaged to be married. Uh, anyway, long story short on that, I got my heart broken. And um, a few months after that happened, I was very ill. And when you work for the C organization, you're getting paid $50 a week when you get paid, forty-seven thirty-five after taxes. And you're expected to pay, you know, for whatever things you need um, outside of the room and board that they give you, whether that's pantyhose, underwear, feminine hygiene products, any sort of um, food that you may want that's not served to you in the dining room, um, like actual food. Um, anyway, uh, my roommate offered to give me a Scientology assist, which is basically like a laying on of hands so that uh, you feel better. <clears throat> and she did that and I had a fever. I probably had the flu. I had like a, you know, like 101.5 fever and I, I just wasn't feeling well. So she did the assist and said, let me tuck you in for bed. And I thought, well, this is very nice. I mean, someone's taking care of me. This is lovely. And um, she kissed me and it was a very electric moment. I had never kissed another girl um, and I almost thought that it didn't happen. Like maybe I'm just having a fever hallucination, but sure enough, um, it happened again and again. And in the C organization, the rules about sex are very, very strict. Before you get married, you are only allowed to hold hands and French kiss. That's it. No rubbing, touching, no anything, not even hugging too long. That can get you massive trouble. So also homosexuality, you know, from reading Dianetics, from uh, various different policy letters written by Alron Hubbard, that basically homosexuals equal the most evil people on the planet. So not only was this forbidden love happening between me and my roommate, but I thought to myself, hmm, what if, you know, what if we just don't break the 2D rules? What if we don't cross the lines? So I had the idea in my mind that if we didn't cross the line, that we wouldn't get in trouble. <laughs> Even though being a homosexual is the worst. Like you can be a pedophile and still be in good standing, but you cannot be gay. So um, our relationship was basically like a year and a half. And then finally we were found out. <clears throat> the resulting actions taken by my seniors uh, was to try and declare me a suppressive person to, and but that means to excommunicate me from the entire church and, you know, basically make me the lowest form of scum on the planet. Um, that didn't happen. The next step was to send me to the RPF, which stands for Rehabilitation Project Force. Now the idea behind the RPF is that you get sent there, you do manual labor, and you <clears throat> and another person uh, work with each other doing, using Scientology techniques to make yourself better. Um, in reality, you're working 10 to 16 hours a day. Um, 10 of those hours are generally spent doing very hard physical work, construction, uh, mill work, 
uh, very, very grungy, grungy work. I mean, we cleaned out buildings of asbestos wearing nothing but a painter's mask and a long sleeve shirt. Um, we were made to do demolitions of buildings with no safety equipment whatsoever. Uh, we would set up and climb 10 stories of scaffolding to uh, redo the stucco on exteriors of buildings. And we were expected to do these things at lightning speed for the generous pay of $12 a week. That's right, $12 a week for almost 100 hours of work. So <clears throat> while doing this, um, I encountered many physical problems. I mean, obviously working your body that hard uh, has massive consequences. I uh, was physically accosted. I broke three ribs. Actually, I didn't break them. Another person broke three of my ribs. Two of my discs in my back were herniated. Um, and I had other injuries. I nearly bled to death. Um, the first day I was on the RPF, this is basically what it's like being on the RPF in a nutshell. The first day I was there, we lined up at lunch for food. And it was a very long line because there was about 220 of us on the RPF at that time. And so you're waiting in line with 220 people to go into this tiny room where they had like one of those salad bar thingy bobs where they were putting big troughs of food in. And it happened to be Hamburger Tuesday. So we get in there and the food isn't there. It's been emptied out by the last people who are in. So we have to wait for more to come. When the chef comes in holding this trough, he has to like move people out of the way. And as he's setting it into this little, you know, display thing, people are diving over each other. They're punching each other in the face and they're grabbing like just fistfuls of hamburgers and fistfuls of french fries and elbowing their way out of the room. And then they sit down at their table and shoveling it in their face as fast as they can because you only have a 20 minute meal break. Now that's 20 minutes to wait in this conga line of over 200 people and then, you know, gladiator style, fight to the death for some food and then sit down and shovel this food in your face, okay? In addition to that, all of these people, I'd say out of the 220 people who were there, 200 of them smoked cigarettes and they were still allowed to smoke indoors. So then while you're trying to eat in your 20 minutes, I want you to imagine 200 people simultaneously lighting up a cigarette and smoking it and then lighting up another cigarette and smoking it at every meal. And being a non-smoker, <laughs> that was very uh, powerfully bad for my health. They finally stopped doing that um, almost a year later some punishments that you would get inside of this organization and on the RPF. Um, if you failed to meet your quota, whatever your job was, you have a quota every week. And if you don't make that quota or get above it, you would be put on beans and rice, which meant that every meal that you ate would be rice and beans. And uh, yeah, so in case, if you don't really like that, that's a kind of a torture. And um, the other form of punishment that was very common was being thrown overboard. Um, the Sea Organization was started on a ship by L. Ron Hubbard. And um, he would toss people off of the ship into the harbor. So since we were on land and specifically in Hollywood, obviously we were not on a boat and didn't have access to a lake or even a pool. So what would happen um, is you would stand inside a trash bucket, large one, and people would come with buckets of ice water and dump them over you while shouting at you and telling you what a horrible piece of shit you are. And then to further your punishment, you have to clean up the mess that's made by you being thrown overboard. Uh, um, when I tried to leave the RPF, I was manipulated very uh, hard. Once again, using my family against me. My mother was still a Scientologist. My sister was working for Scientology, um, using them as pawns to keep me in. When I finally just didn't care anymore and I said, that's it, I'm, I'm going, I'm leaving. I did all of the things they required of me. I got all the security checks they wanted. I did all of the labor they wanted and I waited. In addition to those things, you have to go before a committee of 
your former workers at your organization. So I had to go to Celebrity Center where I worked for five years and stand in front of a group of people who used to be my friends and look them in the eye and I literally said to them, I'm a piece of shit. I am not worth having in this group. I don't deserve to be here with you because I'm not, I'm not a good person. I can't make someone else better and I can't get better and you should just let me go. This is how low I got. And I waited, I waited for their answer. I waited for three months. And every day I was pressured and pressured and pressured and pressured and pressured and told, it's not here yet, it's not here yet. The person in charge of the RPF would slam the door in my face and tell me to go away. Finally, after three months, I couldn't take it anymore and I thought, fuck it, I guess I'm never leaving. I may as well just, I can just go through the motions. So I told the RPF, I say, okay, I'll stay. And he reached down in the bottom drawer of his desk and put right on the desk my approved letter. He said, I knew you'd change your mind. Now a sane person would have leapt across the desk and strangled him to death. But at this point, after almost two and a half years on the RPF, I was not a sane person anymore. I was very broken physically and mentally. And I just said, okay. And I got up and I walked out of his office and I was then put, because I was physically not doing well, I was put into the laundry unit. And one night um, I was tossing, there's like small bags cause it's a weekly thing of laundry. It's basically your underwear and jeans. Um, I was tossing these little bags of laundry down a small flight of stairs to another woman. And I was making her laugh because, you know, when you're on the RPF, you don't get to watch television. You have no radio. You have nothing, not even books. And so our form of entertainment was to reenact uh, movies that we had seen, skits we knew from SNL, sing any song that we could possibly remember, like two sets of lyrics to. So I was doing something I don't even remember. It was ridiculous. And she was laughing. And the RPF I see saw this. Now, when you get sent to the RPF for homosexuality, your life is literally a living hell. Even though they told me no one would know why I was there and it didn't matter. Anytime I smiled at another girl, a report was written. Anytime I put my hand on the shoulder of another girl, a report was written. If I had any form of physical contact with the, another girl, a report was written. Um, I must have had hundreds of reports written by, by the time, you know, I left. Um, so he didn't like what he saw. So he decided to have me get a very special interview. And during this interview, I was asked if I was having sex with this girl, if I had um, kissed her, if I had touched her inappropriately. And I started laughing, honestly, because I thought, this is a joke. <laughs> um, no, no, thank you. Uh, and, um, I tried to leave the interview room. Um, I was not successful. Uh, I was shoved back down in the chair. I stood up again. I was shoved back down again. And at that point I started getting really mad and I said, listen, um, don't touch me again. I'm going to leave. This is bullshit. And I tried to put my shoes and socks back on and they grabbed my shoes and socks and, you know, took them away. Now I was really angry. And I started trying to walk out of the room. Now I have two people trying to push me back in a chair. I managed to push them off of me and I'm slowly walking towards the only exit because we were in this basement, um, refurbished basement area. At one point I'm wrestled to the ground and I have about 15 sets of hands on me while I'm screaming, I've got this arm free and um, I'm screaming and yelling and pounding at the door with this hand and someone from the other side opens it and I got my hands around the door and I just, I guess was coursing with adrenaline and I just ripped this door open and I just fucking like punch these people and I got them off of me. Now, by the time I got up and I started running outside, my face and nose were bloodied from being shoved down onto a like this much padded um, carpet that's over concrete. 
My feet were all bloodied from dragging them across this carpet. And again, a sane person would have run to a fire station or anywhere. I ran to security and I was hysterical and bleeding and, you know, anyway, I got into a huge fight with the RPF I see. He apologized, blah, blah. Um, and the next day, uh, the person in charge of my unit, Caroline Mustard, took it upon herself after breakfast to get this close to my face and tell me for about, I say a good 25 minutes, um, why I was a worthless piece of shit and that the world would be better off without me and that I had never done anything good in my entire life and that, um, what I did the previous night, um, you know, was the worst thing that had ever happened in the history of the C organization and that I was in fact the worst person in the world. Um, she used a lot more colorful language and as I became more and more catatonic, I started to believe her. Um, I went up to the, I decided I wasn't going to do my task of doing everyone's laundry and I went to the second floor and I started scrubbing the walls and I was just hysterical. I was scrubbing and crying and just, I, I, I don't even know what was going on, but um, yeah. And various people came by for the next couple hours to scream at me, to tell me that I was a worthless piece of shit. Um, and I just let them do it. I didn't even react. I just kept scrubbing and crying and scrubbing. I had nothing to say to them. And after about, three hours, I decided this was it. And um, I put myself in the utility closet, which I locked. And in there, there was a pair of rusty scissors. I attempted to slit my wrists, which didn't work out because they were super, super dull scissors. And I thought, I can't even, I can't even fucking kill myself right. I mean, this is pathetic. This is really pathetic. And then um, I saw that they, we had these huge bottles of like industrial strength bleach. And I thought, okay, well, this is it. This is how I'm gonna go. And I poured myself a capful of the bleach and just thought about it. And I thought, I don't, there's nothing else I can do. I've already tried. I've tried everything and I'm, I'm not getting better. I don't, I'm not changing. And I'm never going to leave this hellhole. So I put the cap full to my lips. And the only thing I could think of before I drank it was, I'm sorry, mom. And I drank it, which kids at home don't do that. <laughs> uh, it burnt my esophagus and my stomach. Um, I was choking. They did not call 911. They did not give me actual medical attention by any form of medical professional. Um, they brought me a container of milk to drink to settle my stomach. Um, the suicide drill went into effect, which in Scientology and specifically in the Sea Organization, if you have someone who commits suicide or attempts to commit suicide, the first goal is to get them off of the base because they are now a security and public relations nightmare. So I was very quickly whisked off the base by the medical liaison officer, Quinn Toffer. And he drove me away from the base to the Chevron station on the corner of Vermont and Los Feliz. And he called Dr. Megan Shields, who is a Scientology doctor who I had seen for um, kidney infections and a few other ailments that I had had uh, when I got sick enough to be sent to the doctor during my time on the RPF. Um, she refused to treat me. She broke the Hippocratic Oath and refused to give me medical treatment. I was then taken to, uh, where was it? Oh, I was then taken to All of You Medical Center to the emergency room where I had to convince an ER doctor that Quinn Toffer, who has blonde hair and blue eyes and looks like an Aryan poster child, is my cousin, and that I accidentally drank bleach while cleaning walls because I had 
the story I said was, oh, I had a bottle of Arrowhead water that I was drinking and I had mixed the bleach with some water in an Arrowhead bottle and I mixed the two up and I just had like a little baby sip and like, whoops. And the ER doctor wasn't buying it. <laughs> he kept asking me, is this really what happened? Is this, I want to, I want you to tell me again. And, um, again, a sane person would have said, please help me. I'm being kidnapped. And I drank this bleach because the only way to escape was to try and kill myself. Nope. <laughs> I stuck to my story. Uh, they took me to the extended stay America in Burbank to stay for a couple days while they gave me more sec checks. And even then when I've nearly committed suicide, okay, to leave their organization, the RPF I see shows up and says, so are you done being dramatic? Are you going to come back and get back to work or what? And I thought in my mind, this has got to be a joke. Like, I, I can't even fucking believe this is happening. And I thought, I, I, can't, I can't be made to go back to that. <laughs> so I said, no, I think I, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. And he just, he was in a car when he asked me this. And he just like sped off. He was so disgusted with me that I wouldn't get my shit together to knock off my bad behavior. So um, I was taken home to my mom. Uh, she didn't know I was going to be there. She arrived a few hours later. My stepfather was there and he was very happy to see me. And my mom was very much involved in Scientology. And I had run away a couple times and come to her. So when she did see me there, she asked me if I was there to stay or not, or if I was just there temporarily and I needed to be, you know, decide what I was going to do. And I said, no, I'm, I'm home. And we hugged and, uh, it was a very, uh, emotional moment. I'm getting emotional now. Um, I didn't, I couldn't tell her why, how I had left. What am I going to say to her? You know? Um, so I kept that, what I just told you, uh, bottled up inside for a good five or six years before I actually told her what had happened. Um, but I will say this, the RPF is a hundred percent a concentration camp. It's a legal concentration camp in the United States, in Australia, in Europe, and in England. They're, those are the locations. There's two in the United States and uh, one in Australia, one in England, and uh, one in Europe. And the things that go on there and the mental and physical abuse is, uh, as you can see, it's now been... Whew, 14 years since I left and it still affects me today. Obviously I've moved forward. I have a husband and two beautiful children. Um, we have my husband and I have a business together. Uh, and I still live with my mom who I eventually got out of Scientology. So that's the good news. Um, we are all steer cleared of it now. And part of my task in life is telling the truth about Scientology and getting the word out. Um, but I am a survivor of the RPF. I do have long lasting effects. I still have a terrible back. My ribs still give me problems now. Um, I have terrible nightmares and PTSD from the experiences that I had there, but I don't look at it as a victim viewpoint. Um, I am a victim but I don't live my life as a victim, but I want people to understand that you can be a victim of a crime and be stronger than that and work to get justice for those who have no voice and to help prevent anyone from being put into that position again. The uh, hardest part about leaving was acting like a normal human. I had to erase the mindset that had been drilled into me for almost eight years in this organization. Like when I didn't have, never had used a cell phone. I'd never been on the internet when I left. Um, and I didn't understand how to do things like take a 15 minute break at lunch. 
Um, the first job I got, I got in trouble because I wasn't clocking out for any breaks or lunches. I was eating at my desk while working and they had to, HR had to take me aside and say, listen, you have to take a break or it's very bad for us legally. And I was like, oh, okay. Cause it didn't even make sense to me to not be working the maximum amount of time, um, during the day. I, it took me many years to be able to take care of myself. And the truth of the matter is I wouldn't have made it really at all if it hadn't been for my husband, Cameron, um, meeting him, having him had knowing that he had gone through a very similar experience to mine, being raised in Scientology and joining the Sierra when he was 12. Um, I knew that he got it, that he understood the crazy that was inside of me and wasn't going to try and you know, understand it. He just already knew. And having him with me and helping me through this journey has been tremendous. Um, he gave me my two beautiful children. I mean, what more is there to life? And, and having them save my life. That's, that's definitely true. I can say without a doubt that having my husband and giving birth to my two boys saved my life.